My name is uh, Yaroslav Bondarchuk. Yeah, that's my surname. <laughs> it's pronounced like this. And uh, yeah, um, I work with uh, organizations, uh, with people, with, with teams um, for like all, already eight years now, I believe. Um, I've been working as a project manager. So I started as a pro project manager. Um, then I switched to a, a Scrum Master role. Then it be became my actual regular position. Uh, then there were like a few a few other uh, positions named uh, as agile coach or organizational coach or uh, delivery management consultant and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, it was um, during the whole uh, all my journey. You know, I was uh, working with uh, teams, people, and changes. So yeah, that's basically it <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, my name is Dmitry. Uh, so the surname in question is uh, Vilika Ivanenka. Uh, <laughs> that's probably really hard to pronounce, but um, I, I try to get it, live with it every day. <laughs> um, so for I, I've been with different projects in different spheres around IT for about 13 years now. I started as product manager in Telco uh, quite 13 years ago. After that, I went and was uh, a chief marketing officer for my own startup for about a year which, as I tend to say, if you haven't killed a startup, <laughs> you haven't seen life. <laughs> so that was a part of my life that was quite interesting. After there, from products, I decided I would like to work more with the teams and see how teams actually, how great teams produce products. So I went more into project management and was for some time a project manager from there. I also kind of started getting into Agile and I was really interested about how this team stuff and people stuff works. So this is this is also about I think as Yarik said about eight years ago that started that journey started. Um, so I was a delivery manager for an outsourcing company. At some point I went to GameDev, which is going to be the company we're going to be talking about now. Uh, I think in, in this story together with Yaroslav. Uh, after that it was also some outsourcing, and now we together with Yaroslav are working at a, a our own small company. Uh, that is doing organizational changes, and I work as a coach um, with with companies. And so mostly my focus went from product to process or project management and then to people for the last five to six years. And also as part of this journey, I started going into psychology and um, general things that are related more and focus more on people. So that's about me. Awesome. I think I'm intrigued a little and uh, I'd love for my personal reasons for you to share the common company that you both have co-founded now, right? What do you call that? Because I love the name there. So go for it. <laughs> Yarik, I know you were uh, doing the pitch quite uh, recently. Would you like to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, uh, the name is uh, Organizational Pathfinders. So we, we help uh, companies and uh, organizations to find their own way, their own path um, on their journey uh, related to uh, product and changes, their mission, their vision, um, how the strategy is built uh, upon those. So, uh, yeah, Dima, would you like to, to add anything here? <laughs> well, yeah, I think that this is the essence. And um, I think we have combined all of all of the more than 20 years now of our combined knowledge of working with teams and, and companies into what in essence is a combination of, as we were saying, psychology, because Yaroslav is also, I, I know he's a little bit shy probably, but he didn't mention that he's in transactional analysis now. I'm in guest child and existential therapy. Uh, so we're combining that with our knowledge of teams and products and are trying to help companies kind of see themselves and be whoever they actually want to be and be who they are. <laughs> so this is the essence of organizational pathfinders. And we call ourselves pathfinders, just the reasons because yeah. we help find paths. <laughs> it's beautiful. I remember when we when we struck a chord on this, you know, last time when we spoke, I just love that. So yes, I, I thought our audience should know that too. It's really amazing and um, wonderful how you could enable organizations and people and teams find their paths in their unique journey. So great work up there yeah cool 
So, so for, for the story that you have today for us, um, I think it will be great for us to get some context from the two of you, you know, uh, a little bit about uh, the organization or the context that you'd like to set for us and then let's take it forward from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, so, I, 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 I would suggest Dmitry to start here because uh, he was the one who actually joined the organization that we'll be talking about uh, a bit earlier than I did, mm -hmm. like for two years earlier, I believe, or something. So it yeah. was three uh, even. Oh, okay. So <laughs> uh, go on. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with that, and then you can follow up with the uh, with some of the problems that we have seen working with yeah. the teams. Um, so the, the company in question is a large game development company that's quite famous around the world. <clears throat> and um, I joined it uh, at first as a part of the project management office, which was helping uh, all of the organization. Well, at the beginning was helping just the development part of the organization. Then we moved to support all of the other fun functions, including the publishing and administrative functions. Um, but I was mainly focused on the development for the time being that I was part of that department. And we had different games around the company and I was exposed to a lot of the problems of different teams because at that point in time, the company included 18 studios around the globe. So it was like a really broad spectrum of things I've seen. It was culture dependent for some of the teams. It was really... Um, an interesting landscape and I and I was seeing also how the general organization influences all of the small uh, small studios in different cultures. It was a really beautiful and interesting picture to look at that. But the story we're going to be talking about today was related to one of the largest projects uh, of that company. It was the time when I joined it as a development director uh, to be helping to build a new studio in a new location for the team that was already by that time functioning for 10 years. So it was quite a challenge by itself because there is, a, there is already a structure, there are a lot of connections, there are a lot of people, they know how to talk to each other, they have their own rituals and everything, and now they tell you, hey, you got to build a new team, right? And that has to fit in in all of that context. Uh, at the same time, the challenge um, was really exciting in terms of the product we were working on because the product itself was something new inside the game that uh, the game has been trying to build for quite some years and uh, they couldn't kind of reach it because it was somehow different, somewhat different to what was the general purpose of the game because game, games can be PvP or player versus player or PvE, player versus environment and so the, the game was for quite some time already a PvP game, they never had any PvE experience and the goal for the team was to build the PvE experience inside the game, which was PvP for nine years by that time. Um, so it was quite challenging because of the team, because of the product. And um, yeah, it was um, kind of a great experience in terms of testing everything and looking at the uh, at your capabilities and what the teams could do and how do we work with cultures. Even though those people were working together for like five or six or some of them even 10 years, uh, there were like, what, like Dimitri said, yeah, so there were like new, uh, brand new teams uh, that uh, we actually uh, started to, to, um, to design uh, because of the, the, that switch uh, in, the, in the product and in the processes as well. And um, yeah, so people knew each other, but they were uh, they didn't have any experience uh, working uh, with each other in a, in, in, a, uh, in a single team, right? So um, the process uh, of uh, the product development and uh, the change process uh, were like pretty coupled together, so pretty tight coupled together. And um, yeah, uh, there was also um, uh another another uh, challenge i would say uh so the the teams were uh, growing pretty fast and uh, uh, i think that we've uh, we've grown for for like two times for for, for a year uh, i believe uh, and uh, yeah Dima, uh, am i right here because uh, I, 
don't really remember how, how much people did we have at, at, at the beginning and then um, how fast did we evolve. Mm -hmm. The structure we started with is, uh, so we had to build a studio based on already pre-existing structure uh, of a studio that was developing other, other games and other products for the company. So in there, uh, we had two teams of 14 people that weren't talking yeah. to each other, they were on separate floors, they haven't seen each other, they were like, oh, we exist, right? And they're working on the same product, but they were on different floors. And as we know, <laughs> different floors are almost like different companies. Um, so we we brought them together, so the 20 people. <clears throat> we talked to some of them, especially some of the managers, well, because we were also tasked with actually looking at the approach on how the game has been developing for, for nine years and introducing something new. Uh, at that time, I think the rhetoric was about, hey, could you be more agile and things like that? But we kind of understood, like, what can we do moving forward to show that we can be more flexible, right? Because I think in in, the, in those terms, Agile was kind of used like a, you know, not like a real thing, one thing when you write it with a small letter, but like a, a moniker that you write with a capital Agile and you go like, yeah, you got to be Agile, things like that. Uh, but we were trying to look at the practices and everything. So we took that 14 people, uh, we took to some of them, I've actually helped one of the people move on because she wasn't in the correct role. She actually wanted to be a product manager, but she was a project manager because she had to stay with the company and things like that. So uh, we went down to 25 uh, and then from 25 in a year, we got to 52. Uh, was actually plans to go to about 80 people, I think, at the point in time. And I think if, if I'm if I'm remember if I know correctly by this time, I think the team's around 150 uh, at this moment. It's it's obviously still working. It's functioning. Um, so yeah, it was a challenge because those groups of 14 people were not talking to each other. So you can imagine that we're not actually talking to the other studios that were part of the process of development. So that was quite challenging. And at the same time, combining this with the ask from the management to actually build something new and create. Uh, I think the first mission we started the team was it was become a role model team inside the development of the game, right? And there are some problems with this. I probably can talk about this more. What is the problem of being a role model, right? It's yeah. And actually, this this thing that Dmitry just mentioned, uh, coming from stakeholders, the, the, uh, there was a lot of pressure. On, uh, uh, on us as uh, the leadership team of, of, of the studio and uh, uh, people, I believe as well, uh, developers and uh, yeah, all the engineers that were in the teams. Um, regarding that that kind of role modeling, yeah. So uh, we were uh, like in the how do you call it in the spotlight. <laughs> and everyone was curious. Well, what's what's what, what's going on there? And uh, uh, yeah, so th this dynamic actually uh, also influenced how the uh, changes were uh, going or not going <laughs> in in some way. Yeah, but yeah, but still, th that was a, an element of um, of the change itself. Yeah. Nice. Now I've gotten even more curious. So. So how did you guys take this forward? What did you do to, you know, I don't know, what should I say? To make this a better situation or help people find a better path to where they are today? Mm -hmm. So tell us something more. So I think how I would structure this is uh, we actually had two phases, just to spoil a little bit going forward. And I think, yeah, do you want me to start with the first one and you then go with the second one, how we evolved? Uh, I would start. Uh, I would start with the first one because yeah, uh, I, I, I think I think that was one of the uh, biggest. Uh, uh, you told us not to use the obscene lessons. So um, the biggest mistakes <laughs> in my career. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I would call it so. Yeah, because. Uh, uh, when I joined the company, I thought that um, I knew better uh, that which process, uh, which processes would suit uh, most for for these people, uh, like how the teams should be 
to be designed and uh, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, we actually started to do the uh, to implement uh, the uh, using start, started using less framework. I would say so. Uh, so uh, yeah, we we um, started all the, the ceremonies. And, uh, we uh, tried to uh, design the the, the roles like uh, there should be a chief product owner and. Uh, uh, all, um, th there should be like uh, self-organized uh, teams with uh, uh, running Scrum and um, all those attributes that Les has. Uh, even though I'm a, a big fan of Les, uh, actually that d didn't work because there was a lot of uh, resistance from people who were like, okay guys, uh, uh, why do you think it's uh, the best way of working for, for us? Uh, that was the most polite comment, uh, I think, from uh, <laughs> as far as I remember. Uh, yeah, but there was a, a lot of re resistance, and uh, uh, I like uh, the uh, one thought about resistance that um, I actually uh, like heard from one of my teachers in TA. That uh, actually there is no resistance. There is only uh, only consequences of how you do change, or how you uh, how you actually. Uh, provide all those all, all that information uh, regarding the future uh, for those people who will be in that change. So uh, yeah, um, that was the the, the the hard part because uh, we started doing less, uh, doing agile, not being, and uh, yeah, um, there there were a lot of uh, like. Uh, uh, fights, I, I, I would say. So it, it, one team, there was one, one team who was like uh, really resistant to, to all those changes. They were uh, people who uh, I think worked in the company for the, uh, for the most time. And um, uh, yeah, and I was a Scrum Master for that team. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I've seen a lot. And um, uh, at some point of time, we uh, uh, we got together and uh, decided that we need to change something in how we change the process and how we change the pro the, the, the product development and so so yeah the, that's the the the, fir the first phase and um, even though we were thinking that we are doing great we allowed uh, the teams to do the self design with some restrictions and we thought that we are like pretty agile at this at this spot at this place and uh come on people just go and form the teams and show the the uh self-management the uh, self uh, uh, um, self-direction or something uh mm -hmm. yeah but yeah it, it was not enough actually to 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 to, uh, to become agile actually so yeah um then was the, a second phase uh, where we actually changed the, the way we, we, we implement changes. And uh, yeah, Dima, uh, would you like to uh, yeah. go on with, with this? Yeah. So the idea was that based on what Jaroslav was just describing, um, we seen that it's not working. I, I don't know what gave it away. I mean, <laughs> just listening to what Jaroslav was saying, you know, it was a perfect company. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we, we had a lot of problems uh, with what we did because it was kind of like, I would say that's a forced agility. If this term doesn't exist, it should, uh, because basically that's what we did. Yeah. And then when you try to force a team to be whatever they're not or whatever they're not ready to be, this is what we faced. And it was a good thing that at some point in my practice, I discovered a really good uh, advice from a friend that basically said like every nine to 12 months you should step back from whatever you're doing what, how no matter how good you think the change is or the process that you're working in or whatever you gotta step back and for about a week or something try to look on this from a completely fresh perspective it's sometimes it is called uh, if you were to start this all over again what would you do differently and things like that but I do love to kind of be even more in the shift perspective thing where like okay so 
I don't know anything about this. I'm just looking at how the team works, what's happening, and I'm trying to devise new ideas and kind of to bring in this new perspective because uh, sometimes this allows you to see a lot more of the things you were missing. Um, so at that time, <clears throat> after, let's say, I think it was about a year in, uh, we had a really large postmortem of a feature that we were doing. It was a really, really tough thing. So product-wise, it was a crazy hard thing that we had to do and we managed. And I'm to this day thankful to the team uh, and, and to everyone that was involved in that because it was a really good, really large, crazy, fun project that we managed to do in the time frame that was given. And then we sat down and we're like, okay, but this got to change because we see that, that there are issues. And the interesting thing was here because I was like, I was always looking at this and going like, this sounds weird. But now I think I start to understand is when we first approached the teams and Yaroslav said, we uh, allowed and, and we kind of asked them to self-design into groups. But our problem was that we didn't give them a enough safety, enough safety to understand that, hey, you were staying with the team. Everything's good. Like everything, sh uh, everything sh should be better in the new teams. And we didn't give them any context in terms of like, they kind of understood what they're going to be working on, but they didn't know the people. And as I was saying, there were two groups of 14 people and then we put them in one room and we're like, self-design. Yeah, it didn't strike us at that point that that wasn't a good idea because they, some of them just didn't know each other and they would stick together with the people who already had connections. So you got to have connections before you can do anything in terms of self-designing or self-building or self-managing. Um, so they worked together for a year. They started to form some of the connections. And then we understood that kind of like we went backwards. So we went back to the drawing board. And this is where the practice from niche Mansion comes in. So we use the movers, uh, the movers, movables and immovables in here. Personas. And, Personas. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the persona. So we actually did a breakdown uh, kind of did the small profiles on everyone inside the teams to kind of understand who are they in terms of their position on, on the personas. Less so are they going to be um, just changing a lot and, and helping drive everyone else? Because we understood if you put, uh, we had teams, I think at the point in time, there were six people in the team. Oh, they were up to 10, but uh, an average was six to eight people in the team. And we understood if we put a lot of movers in a single team, What's going to happen? That team's going to move forward and run and be, and be happy and everything. And everyone else is going to go like, yeah, what are you doing exactly? So they're going to be kind of like the outlier. So the idea was that as our second step, and this may sound crazy because I think people do it normally the other way around, we actually help design the teams. So we sat down, we look at the people, we talk to them. Uh, and instead of putting them in the room, we actually went back and did some breakdown on everyone uh, in terms of like, who do we feel they are? We asked them about how do they feel inside the teams. And based on that, we proposed structures uh, of the new teams uh, to the people. And I think we actually got a really better result comparing to the first one. Although, although, which was a really funny fact, after the self-design that we did in the first part, we sent a, uh, a questionnaire to the team asking how happy are you with the new teams? And out of five, which was the, post the highest mark, and everyone in that group answered to around 30 answers to 30 people, we got 4.76. So we had a really, really high number saying, yeah, we're absolutely happy, which actually turned out to show that it's, I think the problem was the questionnaire rather than was the happiness of the team. And it's actually not representing. So you got to keep in mind that sometimes the answers you want to get from the team are the answer the team that is going to give you. And th this is really, really important when you're designing questionnaires and when you're asking questions. If the question is not open, you're pretty much going to get the answer you're looking for. Is it the right answer or is it, it does it have any connection with the actual world? No, <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> but people are just, might be afraid to tell you or they see that you're expecting something of them. So they're like, okay, here you go. Here's your 476 uh, out of five if you would just you know would like to prove yourself that you did a good job with, with the second approach we did more granularly we talked with the uh 
was the delivery managers or the team leads. We, we, we had a really fun time about devising a name for a person who was uh, driving the team forward. Uh, I think this is, uh, we might do it in a different talk, but we have a different framework that we use for devising roles. And it's not just Scrum Masters yet, except he was a Scrum Master, but I don't quite agree. I think it was a larger part of that role because most of the HR practices were run by the same people. So we kind of designed the organization a bit differently so that we don't have as much people, but we have focused people working on uh, specific uh, parts of the uh, of the work routines. Yeah, um, I think that uh, I've started as a Scrum Master, I would say so. And yeah, yeah. the role has evolved. Uh, but we had less. Yeah, right? uh, <laughs> yeah but together with our approach to the, to, to the changes, and so the, the role evolved as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to kind of sum this up, first we, uh, at the second try, what we did is we figured out more about what the people wanted, actually sat down with them, asked them about how do they think about the teams. So we came with, came with, we came with the propositions of what are the new teams uh, that we want to form together with them. Also taking into account how the organization is going to grow because we are, as we were saying, we're hiring extremely fast. Uh, and secondly, what we did is we came to them and we said, here is the process that you've been working on, that you probably are now familiar with. Because when we first introduced class, we kind of did a small class for about two days. Some of the people already knew some stuff uh, from previous courses were working with different teams. But um, <clears throat> it was just, just throwing them into cold water. But this time we said, okay, so you worked with this. What do you like? What would you like to change? What are the things that you don't like about this? And I think the funny thing is they pretty much just wanted to get to get rid of the name, kind of like it's not less. It's our process. And when it became yeah. their process, when they were allowed to change some things, it was basically just the name of the meeting mostly because they didn't change the, the substance of the meeting and what was inside them. They just wanted to make it personal. And I, I love this yeah. thing that Yerik told me about, about uh, create your own scrum, right? And I think this, in terms of process, this worked every time since we learned the lesson from that team. That is awesome. Okay. You know, you get something to become yours and then of course you want to take full ownership of it. And that's really what, what's needed uh, to get change to move faster too. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we started it as a revolution, then it became an evolution actually. Yeah. And uh, yeah, one, one interesting thing here is that one of the teams uh, decided to move from Scrum to Kanban, and uh, they still uh, kept uh, working together with uh, the Scrum teams within one uh, single framework, like scale uh, development framework. But it was not really bothering uh, the rest, so uh, they were still pretty. Uh, pretty good at doing their work and uh, they were um, like at the high performance as far as I, as I remember so yeah uh, well we we started using the change board so it, it was a physical physical change board so like Kanban, uh, Kanban board uh, mature to level zero I believe uh, so we used this one as a, um, as an alignment point for the leadership team um so that we know what, what change are we actually working on now how it's related to all the other initiatives that we have and how we, how we proceed with it and um it was also uh, uh an element of uh, transparency for uh the uh, development teams so it was a physical board that uh, anyone could like come up to and see, okay, so these guys are now working on, on this and this and this. And oh, oh, okay, here's the problem that I raised uh, during my last retrospective with my team. It's already on their board and it's already in progress. And here's the person who is responsible for uh, removing this or that or that blocker or enabling this or this or this. And um, actually, I, I think that also helped to um, reinforce the the belief in the retrospectives so the as a, as a tool right so uh, the team could see that okay these are the problems that we could that can solve as a team together and these are some things that should be like um, managed by 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 the leadership team or uh some other studios we had a lot of dependencies uh like uh external dependencies on um uh, 
other people, other studios that are not, uh, were not in Ukraine actually. So yeah, and they could see it uh, like transparently and clearly. We've also uh, did a kind of uh, town halls uh, each each month or Dima. So I, yeah. I wouldn't say those town halls because if you if you remember we um, so. so our feedback in terms of what we were doing for the team was coinciding with the end of the sprint every three weeks yeah. with the and then so yeah, basically so we'll... before mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah before it was a town hall and now the town hall was uh, actually the overall uh, sprint review so yeah so the the, the ceremony was uh, called a bit differently but still the the essence of it was the overall sprint review from less and yeah, that's what that was a, a meeting where we also uh, showed our our results or uh, or challenges or, or fails, and it was also okay. Yeah. Nice. You're good. absolutely right. I, I, oops, sorry. I completely forgot the word town halls before we actually moved to that. Yeah. Uh, but so I think the the essence um, of, of of this was that as a group of managers that work with different teams and were supporting the whole studio, we understood that we have our own sprint. And in this three weeks that the team was actually working on the product itself, we were working on some changes inside the studio and what's then and the different things and questions that are being raised at the retros or during the day-to-day -day activities. So we thought it would be a great idea to do the sprint review together with the team. It's just focused on actually the I don't want to say the management practices, but basically on, on the operation side. Yeah, oh, well, let's call it this way. On the operation side of the team, so how we were functioning and what we were looking into. We did the uh, recruitment update, typically as in who joined, we gave some time for the introductions. Uh, and it, it, was, it was quite a great place. And it was it was a possibility to at least, at least three weeks get together and see all of the picture of how the studio is evolving, what we're working on, where we're moving to and and people were asking a lot of questions and hopefully we were answering them as as, as good as we could yeah i'm just taking a long pause i didn't want to interrupt anybody <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay uh no uh, this is Brilliant. So what I've heard now so far, and tell me if I'm missing something, right? In At least in the second bit that you just shared, the second example, uh, where you talk about the physical change board. So I'm hearing information radiation or information refrigeration. That's how I love to call it. So, you know, everything mm -hmm. out there transparently. And what I love about this piece is, you know, where people can actually come and see, oh, we gave these actions in our retrospectives, we came out of this, it's already on the board, people are acting on it. So it's not that it's being done just for the sake of being done. So just doing a retrospective, but it's actually being taken forward. Uh, I also love the fact that, you know, you're talking about repurposing the existing rituals. So people also don't get overburdened with, oh my God, now we'll have to do something new. So you were talking about town halls, getting repurposed, becoming sprint reviews, and you know, also from a very focused or a niche perspective that can be taken forward from a uh, for leadership there. So that's uh, another thing. And in the previous example, I know you said that maybe, you know, uh, the second thing should have been done first, but that also proves that change is not linear, right? That's the whole beauty of it. It starts where you are. You captured insights from where you began. And you just, of course, you even made some assumptions. People would behave this way. And then they were like, yeah, okay, whatever. Let's just, you know, do this. And boom, <laughs> at a certain point, you face resistance. And then you were like, hmm, if everything was perfect, why, are, why is anyone pushing back, right? Shouldn't happen. Yeah. That also then got you to do step two, which was really which now you think should have been better to do that as step one, but hey, it happens when it happens. And that's where you'd already figured out your new insights and now you knew your new approaches to move forward, the new experiments of how you wanted to co-design the whole structure with those people because now you had figured out what your movers, movables and immovables and oh, it's beautiful. I love the story. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. 
Mm. So, at, this po- at that point of time, we actually didn't use the experiments and uh, or insights or uh, hypotheses or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were using using just these elements, and yeah, uh, still they were really helpful. And uh, yeah. But look at the core points that it brought out and i love the fact that you know the two advices i think and i don't remember the exact words but the two advices that you said from a resistance point of view yaroslav and i think dimitri you mentioned something about the startups right at the beginning i think they're amazing points to bring through uh because yes uh life is a little different when you start working actually or co-working with teams and when you're trying to enable and give them the environment, of course, you're making some assumptions to go forward. And guess what? Uh, sometimes your assumptions are not going to work, but you learn from them. And I think in both your stories, there are so many learnings that you yourselves picked up on the way to then inspect and adapt your own way of working, which is what is you know, expected of us as change agents, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It is absolutely. I think for, for me, one of the most important things is understanding what it, what is the um how influence is different from control and from bystanding right it's kind of like you're trying to fit in that middle where you are leading but at the same time you're not pushing and also you're touching but at the same time you know not kind of withdrawn and just looking in there and observing what's happening so i think it's it's the beauty of of change that lies in that metaphor of, of understanding how to do that guidance um connected with what the people want. And it, it was a learning curve for us. Uh, absolutely. I mm, I think I learned a lot in there. Um, another thing probably that we, we didn't mention, I see, I look at our notes on the things we wanted to talk about mm-hmm. and wanted to mention that um, it, we had different structures, right? So we had three perspectives looking um, at what we were working on. One was the team perspective, as we spoke about a lot here. Another one was the tech perspective, and that was the product perspective. So those are kind of like the three overviews we try to look at the teams every time. So from tech perspective, what we did is we did communities of practices quite a lot uh, inside uh, inside the different, and at that point, so we took functions as in the QA, the development, the design, and <clears throat> the leads of functions, they organized the communities of practice. At least there was the perspective. Uh, we again came from the functional leads that were in the company, as you said, already said, like we took the practice that was in there and we asked them, what could you do not to be leading, uh, but to try to more guide the people? As in, could you give away some of your power that you have invested in you to the people so they become more self-aware, self-sufficient? And by doing that, most, most of our leads used clean coffee actually in there. So we helped them facilitate the first sessions so that they kind of got it from uh, from the grounds up and started running with it because it is a really easy and well-used format. It allows for a lot of creativity and openness for the people uh, that are participating. And it's really, really lightweight. So I think this is also another practices that we started using in there and has become I think essential in a lot of the things we're doing together with Yarik moving forward. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we, we actually we, we actually used it for ourselves when we were discussing anything, and then uh, we just uh, yeah introduced this uh, this tool this practice to the leads of the of each uh, community of practice. So they were actually engineers, but uh, they were really happy to 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 uh to know that there is this cool format that we use to uh to like create an, an environment and a place for like fruitful communication where people are not like uh, arguing or fighting um, yeah because of the facilitation of the, of the technique itself they were like trying to to be heard uh, it, uh, everyone could be heard actually when uh, when they were talking about the problems or ideas or uh, even some small uh, pet projects they were uh, that they were able to introduce during those uh, uh, meetings and th- that was a place for uh, everyone to be uh, to be like uh, to be heard actually so yeah yeah that, that that one was really cool 
Yeah, indeed. I mean, lean coffee allows all those options, right? For everybody's voice to be out in the open and yeah, everybody's perspective means a lot. It leads to good dialogue. So brilliant. Awesome. Okay, in the interest of time, <laughs> and I'd love to go on for the next one hour, and I'm sure both of you can. Uh, the story is beautiful, it's weaving through. Uh, here's my question. So for others, uh, other change agents on this journey, maybe similar or, you know, in line with yours, would be exactly the same, but in line with what your own journeys have been so far, uh, if you had to give other change practitioners, change agents an advice, what would that advice be? <laughs> My advice is always go to personal therapy. It helps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so this is this is more connected with uh, the teams want the teams want to be heard, and to be able okay. to hear the teams, you gotta be able to hear a yourself. And when you're starting to hear yourself, you're able to hear other people talk because when you allow for space for that conversation to happen, this is where the change happens. Because when the conversation happens, you you and the other person or a group of people can understand something new and something different. And this is actually the place of change. So the more space you have inside yourself for other people, the, uh, the easier the change goes. Oh, that's beautiful. It's deep and it's also very just out, right? It's about you, the other and the whole context and the space. That's yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Dimitri. Yaroslav. Yeah, well, uh, um, I strongly believe that uh, organizations and people in them have a, a right to live a fulfilling life. Uh, that's the phrase that I actually always try to uh, try to convey when I uh, speak on uh, anything related to the changes and uh, especially changing culture because uh, a lot of people are focused on, on that um, in the scope of uh, agile transformations and all this kind of stuff. So uh, I think that changing culture to some kind of predetermined outcome is probably impossible uh, just as uh, in therapy, in personal therapy, it's not possible to prescribe an individual uh, particular future. So uh, what we can do here is to uh, um, uh, just take a step back and um, help uh, the teams and the people in them to be heard, uh, to, um, um, to say what they need and actually help them to achieve that. And that would be the, the, the best thing that you can do as a, as a leader or as a manager. Oh, well, yeah, that's it. Once again, uh, really deep and beautiful advice from both Yaroslav, yourself and Dimitri. So thank you both. And for all those watching uh, this amazing story, um, yeah, do, do create the space for this amazing advice from the Pathfinders. And uh, yes, if we have to reach out to you guys, I am sure we'll be able to place some links below this video. So feel free to reach out to Dimitri and Yaroslav. And uh, thank you again, both of you, sh for sharing this awesome story with us. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah, thank you very much, Erika, for this opportunity. And uh, yeah, I think this is the first time when we actually uh, told this story. So yeah, uh, thanks. thanks for that. You're very welcome, man. We look forward to many more stories. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.